Greetings, my fellow free and sovereign thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful swampy mangroves of South Florida. And today's date is Wednesday, December 21st, 2016, and it is winter solstice. So all those folks out there are celebrating this time of the day for the, for the new season. Bless it wisely. Yeah, and, um, yeah, it's interesting stuff. I've been checking out a few things. It looks like, uh, U.S. Attorney General Corman Ortiz has resigned. There's some controversies with her, including the death of Aaron Schwartz, which, according to some sources, that she was trying to prosecute him for things and led to his suicide, allegedly, or his death. So I'll just keep that very clear. And... I was reading yesterday that, um, or actually today, about someone ripped, took out the satanic pentagram out of the park in bulk of Raton. And, of course, an Uber driver in Aventura, Florida, which is like north of Miami, defended himself from a couple of assailants that wanted to rob him. And uh, what happened was no charges were filed against him. However, the one survivor will face charges of robbery, attempted armed robbery, and second degree murder. That's how it is in the. Florida law. If you get involved in a crime, or there's any innocent bystanders, if that person's, if you're a, if you're a compadre, I would say that'll be the word to use. Is involved in a crime and you is killing yourself. If that person dies, you are charged for second degree murder. So this is this an old common law. It's been in the books in Florida for years. And I have to say, based on information, the driver for Uber. The assailants from trying to rob the man chose poorly. And I know there's a claim, too, that Uber had a policy of no firearms. But the question I have for this particular company, if you're going to fire him, can you prove to me the police are obligated to protect him or any of your Uber drivers? If so, you better have some damn good merit. Because I guarantee you one thing, you won't find it. Yeah, so... um. I was gonna, be, yeah, I was gonna just go and just uh, do my thing. Still at the CJ's Java Lounge, cool place to check out for the bull mom and pa places. Good coffee, good vibes, good young folks. They have some few little TV screens, a lot of it idiot stuff, but it's nice. We got some music in the background, so you expect you could probably hear that. So and uh, yeah, we'll just start off. Actually, I'm gonna post one of the things here of the under arc. Um, Archives.gov, the U- U.S. Electoral College, the certificate of vote, and everything on PDF format. And of course, uh, many of the states have released it on there and expect more to come. So I'm going to add it on there so you can folks go and just see it for yourselves without any here he says, she said garbage. So I'm definitely going to put that on there. All right, and I don't have to really go too detailed, but the whole vote came in December 19th, and of course on January 6th, Congress will verify everything to make it official. This is how it is in the Constitution, like it or not, to all those folks that believe popular, yeah, popular votes is legal. Forget it, you're in a wet dream, my friends. That's what we call the United States, not the centralized states, okay? So, firstly, I, I got caught my eye here. Actually, um... Truth Dig retweeted this, which was really good. It was actually from Truth Dig, Eric Ortiz. It says here why we need to protect freedom of the press in a post-truth world. And of course, here this first appear appeared on um, GetVeryBit.com. Every bit is an all out, all what app for journalism. Our mission is to inform and connect to the world. So all you folks out there, they're like activists and, and and have journalistic skills use it okay because everyone needs the right to know the truth and accuracy of what's going on in the world and as it reads here in 1961 president john f Kennedy delivered an address to the american newspaper publisher association in new york city his speech titled the president and the press was a response to the bay of pigs failure for the united states and examined the responsibility of journalism in finding communism during the cold war Without debate, without criticism, no administration, no country can succeed and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. 
and that this is that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment. Only the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to assume and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to our to our to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices. To lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news for it no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improve understanding of the news as well as improve transmission. And it means finally that government at all levels must be its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security and we intend to do it self-explanatory correct absolutely despite his apparent respect for press freedoms candy was in fact calling for journalists to censor themselves in the name of national security the message was considered a misstep he did not push it again so in that perspective He's a human, but he never harped it. All right. If American history is psych, uh, psych, psychological, as historians Arthur M. Schlesinger Sr. and Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. believe another revolution has come to in the United States. This revolution has nothing to do with Donald Trump. This re- revolution has to do with how the world of Trump gets covered. Journalism is essential to freedom and democracy. I can say the republic, just to add that to it, okay? But in today's post-truth, facts, optional world, freedom the press is under attack. This corporation is controlled 90% of all media. This consolidation limits the, the stories that get reported and information that gets decimated. Mainstream media is corporate media. It is not neutral. There's a spin. News is slanted with hidden agendas. As a result, we don't get the whole story. We get public relations. Accuracy is essential. Remember that. Even Pope Francis is alarmed. I think the media have to be very clear, very transparent, and not fall into no offense intended. The sickness of coprophilia, a rouse of excrement that is always wanting to cover scandals, covering nasty things, even if they are true, he said. Yeah, uh, deprecation of information. I'm not a big fan of Pope Francis either, so I'll just leave it at that. And since people have a tendency towards the sickness of coprophilia, eating excrement, a lot of damage can be done. The pontiff who calls spreading fake news a sin believes dispersing this information is the wrong thing media can do but it directs opinion in only one direction and omits the other part of the truth. The trouble started more than a decade ago. Newspapers was forced to slash budgets and staff. Networks merged, no newsrooms contracted. The journalism industry has not has never recovered, nor has the quality of coverage news. In the 1990s, daily U.S. newsrooms had over 56,000 journalists in 2017. That number will be around 28,000, so it was 50% when you think about it. American Society News editors stopped counting. The numbers are too depressing. As newsrooms continue to shrink, diversity advances at snail's pace, often failing to reflect the communities they cover. This reality has created a big problem for journalism. Public trust in U.S. media has sunk to a new low. The new business understatement, the internet, and lost its market advantage. Now technology companies control the distribution of news. The journalism industry has struggled to find a sustainable business model for mobile. mobile, mobile. Many media, media companies have a mission of bottom line over journalism. And technology companies are not big on sharing the wealth. That's how we got here. A state of crisis in journalism. Many news organizations don't have the resources to do to do local reporting. They are not making money. The, the journalism industry is on track to make it worse. 
as mobile continues eating the world the new business is in danger of going out of business without journalism we will all lose so on Thursday we will explain how to solve news business problems and I think I should check this out as well and one thing about it because there are some fantastic people out there who are investigative journalists and they're being attacked as well they're being murdered and they're being like found you know dead on arrival which is a total deception of what's been happening and Mr. Ortiz I have to agree with him on this but the problem is how come a lot of folks don't really see the bigger picture so um, it's from Lichen.com by the way and I will um, leave this on here I know there's either multiple articles below this which you can folks can read on your own so don't even sweat it yeah I will just leave it at that but um, yeah that's just how you gotta look at it and it's sad because that's why they've thrown money not being made and that's why now you're seeing like the YouTube stuff and all that I always observe responsibly to be exact but without Freedom protect we need without protecting the freedom of the press we're in deep crap doesn't matter who's in there local federal state or national regardless of what party they're in we gotta keep we gotta preserve this to the core you know those folks out there are doing trying to do everything what's right in journalism whether you're independent or work for a company I salute you do everything honorably and in good faith and we and the readers out there need to observe responsibly as well all right well this one here came from black a black I got this from blacklisted news it originally came from Steve McMillan who was a freelance writer and editor of the analyst report and it says here CIA Hawk called for the US to deliver a painful blow to Putin one week prior to ambassador being assassinated on the evening of the Monday, the 19th of December, day before Russia, Turkey, and Iran were scheduled to meet in Moscow to discuss the Syrian conflict, the ambassador, Russian ambassador to Turkey, Andrei Karlov, was assassinated while speaking at an art exhibition in Ankara. The assailant has been identified as Medvalit Mert Altinas, a 22-year-old off-duty Turkish police officer who reportedly had just returned to duty last month after being suspended over suspected knowledge of the failed July coup attempt. The video footage of the attack shows Altina shouting Allah Akbar moments after shooting Karlov, in addition to yelling to don't forget Aleppo, don't forget Syria. According to certain pro-government newspapers in Turkey, Altina may have had ties to the Golan movement, a movement led by the U.S.-based cleric fell to a Golan. That's the same individual, if I'm correct, that's supposed to be responsible for the coup attempt that passed up this past summer. The CIA has intimately connected for the Golan movement for years, as author F. William Agnall has extensively documented. There's links for that too, so you can check it out yourself. Just a coincidence. Six days prior to the assassination, a hawkish formerly deputy director of the CIA, who also served as the acting director twice, Michael Morrow called for the U.S. to respond to alleged Russian meddling in the U.S. election by retaliating in a way that was both over and painful to Putin. It should be noted that the whole narrative of Russia meddling and or hacking a Fox one as no proof has been presented to the public thus far and is merely the latest effort to demonize Moscow due to the fact that Russia prevented the West and their allies forcing regime change in Damascus. In reality, morale was advocating retaliation against Russia because Moscow had the audacity to stand up to the U.S. in the Middle East and because Russia meddled in the U.S. election. Speaking of the Atlantic Council, a Washington-based think tank, on the 13th of December, Morrow said, in order to, for a response to actually result in deterrence, two things have to be true. One, it has got to be over. It has to got to be seen. And two, it has to be painful to Putin. That responsibility for responding to the to what Russians did here is largely that of the Obama administration because it happened under the watch. I am a little concerned that the response is going to fall through the cracks of the transition just in the way the U.S. response to the USS coal bombing on October 12, 2000 fell through, fell through the cracks of the transition between the Clinton administration and the Bush administration. 
perhaps Morrow's comments and the assassination was were unrelated, and the shooting was carried out on behalf of the militants in retaliation for the Russian military campaign in Syria without CIA's knowledge. But then again, perhaps they were related, and the CIA, in coordination with other intelligence agencies, were involved in the assassination. Franz Klintsevich, the first deputy chairman of the Committee on Defense and Security at the Russian Federation Council, has questioned whether the, the West was involved in the shooting, saying that represented the NATO Secret Service may have been behind it. Interesting, right? Morrow's comments certainly reveal the kind of strategic discussions that were and are taking in the think tank circles in the West. We know for sure that the assassinations were both overt and painful to Putin, that the shooting took place in a highly public place, and Putin had a fairly close relationship with Karlov, the Russian president said in a statement that Karlov was a good-hearted person that he knew personally, in addition to stating that the assassination was an attempt to disrupt Russian-Turkish rapprochement, rapprochement and the resolution of the Syrian conflict. Ambassador Karlov was a very good-hearted person. I knew him personally, so I'm not speaking from hearsay. Last autumn, during the vis my visit to Turkey, Ambassador Karlov accompanied me all the time this murder is clearly a provocation aimed at undermining the improvement and normalization of russian turkish relations as well as undermining the peace process in syria promoted by russia turkey in iran and other countries interested in settling the, the conflict in syria recip tayyip erdogan the turkish president also called the assassination a provocate provocation as well as describing the incident as a false flag attack. I believe this is an attack on Turkey, the Turkish state, and the Turkish people, and also a clear provocation in terms of Turkish-Russian relations. I'm sure our Russian friends also see this fact, both Turkey and Russia, the will not to be deceived by this false flag attack, since Erdogan apologized to Putin for shooting down a Russian plane on the Turkish-Syrian border in November 2015, Moscow and Ankara, have been trying to rebuild tides. Although it has not always been a smooth path, Russia and Turkey appear to be moving closer to each other. The arranged agreement between Ankara and Moscow over the Turkish Stream Project, a natural, natural gas pipeline that will run from Russia to Turkey via the Black Sea and potentially be extended into Southeast Europe. It's illustrative of the improvement in relations between the two countries. If Turkey, Russia, and Iran manage to forge an agreement over Syria, this will bring Syrian conflict much closer to being resolved, considering the role Turkey has played in supporting the rebels in neighboring Syria. This was a clear motive for certain factions with the C within the CIA and other intelligence agencies to attempt to impede the Turkish-Russian rapprochement to disrupt the potential of an alliance between Turkey, Russia, and Iran emerging. The shooting may, be also, may also be an attempt to send a message to Putin that figures close to him can be assassinated with ease. We should not forget that Putin's favorite driver was killed in a freak road accident in September. Can we say, can it be a, like uh, this could be a higher, like a, a provocateur thing? Absolutely. Because based on CIA's past history, it has happened. So the, technically, the CIA's credibility is not, is unmeritable. They can deny all this they want, but based on, like I said, based on their actions in the past, credibility, you got to see the bigger picture. And I, I do find things pretty strange as well with the, with the shootings and so forth. So um, we have to really like keep our eyes on this and it's time to stop the CIA to stop meddling in people's affairs and vice versa. All right. So hopefully it's not the case, but anything's possible. All right. Remember that time when the Mississippi, when that church in Mississippi attacked an African-American church? Well, this is from LibertyBlitzkrieg.com. And uh, it says here, black man arrested in Mississippi arson attack on African-American church. Woo! As it says here, one week before the U.S. presidential election, Hopewell Baptist Church in Greenville, Mississippi, was set ablaze and the words, vote Trump, were sprayed, painted on its side. Here's what the disturbing scene looked like. And there's a photo for that. Although nobody knew 
who did it or their motivations at the time, many immediately and irresponsibly categorized it as a hate crime, as CNN reported. Investigators continue to collect evidence. There are no suspects yet. Greenville Chief Delano, Delano Wilson said at the news conference later, Wilson told CNN that police brought in a person of interest Wednesday afternoon and are interviewing this person to determine if they had any participation in this event or if we can clear them. Police are investigating multiple motives, including that the fire could be a hate crime. Mayor Eric Simmons said he spoke to some of the church, some churches, 200 congregants who were fearful and felt intimidated. They felt vandalism was not just an attack on the church, but on the black community. He said, it happened in the 50s, it happened in the 60s, but we're in the 2016 and that should not happen, he said. Fortunately, that's not what happened, as the AP just reported. This is from Jackson, Mississippi. Mississippi authorities arrested a man Wednesday in the burning of an African-American church that was also spray painted the words, vote Trump. Andrew McClinton of Leyland, Mississippi was charged with first-degree arson of a place of worship, said Warren Stain, spokesman for the, Depart for the Mississippi Department of Public Safety. Mc McClinton is an African-American. McClinton was arrested in Greenville, where Hopewell Missionary Baptist Church was burnt and vandalized November 1st, a week before the presidential election. An investigation continues, but state officials said authorities don't believe politics was the reason for the fire. We don't believe it was politically motivated. They may have been some efforts to make it appear politically motivated. Mississippi Insurance Commissioner Mike Cheney, who is also the state fire marshal, told the Associated Press, after the fire, Hopewell congregants began worshiping in the chapel and predominantly white First Baptist Church of Greenville. The Hopewell mission, Clarence Green, said last month that the generosity of the First Baptist Church demonstrates that unlimited love transcends social barriers. James Nichols, senior pastor at First Baptist, said the Hopewell members are welcome to stay as long as they need a home. The reason I highlight this is to remind everyone that a smart thing to do is not to jump to conclusions on events before evidence emerges. As we should all by now, not everything is as it seems in Liberty, Michael Krieger. So they have a suspect, Andrew McClinton, who is allegedly charged, who is charged for allegedly a first degree arson of faith of worship. So I'm not going to jump to conclusions, but he's innocent until proven guilty regardless. But the suspect is an African American, so beep, false start, CNN, ten yard penalty, repeat, third down. Absolutely. So we have to always see it that way, my friends. And this is why you don't jump to conclusions. Even when they exploit the daylights out of it, you don't get motor psychologically aroused because it can burn you when you least expect it. Always observe responsibly. I know I preach that a lot. And this is why, my friends, you have to see everything before you make some conclusions. All right. So I'll be back in a moment. Cool. So next thing we're going to be doing here, this came from truthout.org. It says here, by making Palestinian visions invisible, Google and Apple Maps facilitate their Demolition. This is by David Palomo Liu. As it reads here, when President elect Donald Trump's announcement that he's nominating David Freeman to fill the post of U.S. Ambassador to Israel, a person who has declared a two state solution to be a suicidal peace with radical Islamists and who, is accused, who has accused American Jews who support such a measure of being no better than Nazis. Concern their demolitions will follow under the Trump regime has added more urgency to ongoing efforts to save Palestinian villages from being demolished. The current struggle to demand that Israeli government, excuse me here, Google and Apple Maps acknowledge and mark the existence of Palestinian villages such as Zoya is a rare instance in which U.S. politicians have stood up to Israel in a meaningful way. For many years, Israel has been intent on demolishing the Palestinian village of Zoya 
and displacing its 300 some residents in order to build a Jewish settlement here. There. This historical land grab has attracted some unlikely opponents. Through a series of letters since 2015, California Senator Dianne Feinstein, well known for her apparent support of Israel, has opposed the motions in the debate with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Representative Anna Eshoo, a Democrat from California, also recently drew attention to this issue. She wrote to Secretary of State John Kerry urging him to take immediate action to prevent the demolition of the Palestinian village of Suzia. And according to Rabbi Eric Asherman, co-founder of the Israeli Interfaith Human Rights NGO, Hakwo, the field also conveyed GPS data files to Google, so uh, it could place hundreds of missing Palestinian villages on its map. Similarly, Representative Mike Hahn, a Democrat from California, asked Apple to make those villages visible on its maps. I have to make, make, I have to admit this. I am not a fan of some of these people, but you know what? I have to agree. Why? So, why are these mainstream mobile politicians suddenly so interested in this tiny village? And why do they see these high-tech maps as so crucial? As Feinstein notes in her July 28, 2015 letter to Netanyahu, this village has existed in the South Hebron Hill at least since the 1830s. The residents have, been, have made good faith efforts to inhabit their homes legally. For instance, in October 2013, the ICA, Israeli Civil Administration, rejected a proposed master plan drafted with the support of the Israeli NGO rabbis for human rights, which would have allowed Salazia's resident to build homes legally and connect to the available water and power grids, demolishing civil civilian structures and displacing innocent families undermines Israel's security and isolate it from the community of nations. However, this argument does not seem to bear much force in the relation to the decision-making of Israeli politicians. It is clear that so long as Israel denies these permits, making the structures permanently illegal, it can claim to lawfully demolish these villages and continue the expansion of the Jewish settlements. The United States Department and indeed the world community recognize these settlements as illegal and as an obstacle to peace. Israel's recent response had been unilaterally declared them legal. We can see this battle then as part of the diplomatic war over what is actually legal and what it deemed to be so won by other protagonists of their self-interest alone. One of the linchpins in Israel's argument is that the land in question was never really inhabited by Palestinians. And here, where the map maps play a, cru a critical role in his August 11, 2015, letter Feinstein, Netanyahu claims, contrary to Palestinian claims, that the area has been inhabited for decades. Only a handful of structures continue to expand the illegal construction by exploiting the seas and deceased in order that temporarily prohibited Israel from demolishing these structures. In the contrast to his claims, Mitchell Picnic, vice president of the Foundation of Mil for Middle East Peace Notes, according to Israeli human rights groups, group Betezelum, Selim, Betezelum, the Palestinian village of Kurbet Suzia has existed for at least a century. It appears on maps as far back as 1917. Decades before Israel began occupying the West Bank, aerial photographs from 1980 show cultivated farmland and livestock pens indicating the presence of an active community there. So who is right? And what evidence is there to support either claim? Maps can be essentially testament, essential testaments to human presence, history, and culture. They are also highly political, politicized, shaped by map makers' own political visions which informs the contours, dimensions, spaces, and status of any item or even its existence in our high-tech world. Why, where there are so re reliant on digital media to locate ourselves in our surroundings, image appear and disappear with a uh, keystroke. That, and this is dangerous, only recently the West Bank and Gaza suddenly disappear from Google Maps. 
Google insisted that there was simply results of a bug. But what is going on in the case of destruction of these villages is quite different because it is calculated. In October 2016, a group of Palestinians are working with the Rebuilding Alliance of Burley Game California delivered letters to the Silicon Valley headquarters of Google and Apple requesting that they both update their maps with data that had been missing. Huh. Interesting, huh? Donna Bransky Walker, founder and executive of the Alliance, explained the truth out that on Apple Maps, at least 550 villages were invisible to the world. Google Maps miss about 220 villages, the ones in the sea area currently. Google Maps and Apple Maps show Israel settlements and outposts, which are illegal under international law and violate US pol official U.S. policy while anonymously depicting an empty countryside that in reality contains hundreds of Palestinian villages. There's some maps on here you can see for yourselves. A uh, November press release from Rebuilding Alliance quote Nava Shear, a GIS mapping expert at Bingcom planners for planning rights according to Shear, thousands of children and families in Area C of the West Bank can't locate their homes on a Apple or Google Maps or on Waze which is a Google subsidiary. There are real locations, however, in the virtual map of the world of the web, map world of the web, they simply can't be found. In today's online society, that's as good as saying you don't exist. Rabbi Asherman insists, insists that this is a human rights issue, not an issue on Israel's security, he told Truth Out. This is a human rights issue because the entire might of Israel is focused on removing Susia from the face of the earth. And Susia is just one of the hundreds of such villages. According to Asherman, the situation is law a long-standing one with some villages being destroyed again and again. And this is part of a larger political project that has been going on for years with terrible effects, Asherman says. These people have been moved and displaced time after time after time. The psychological toll on people is devastating. People end up in therapy and children are traumatized for life. People need to understand it is not the banging or neutral process. It is a very intensive, inten intens intensively political process and B and B. It's not about security. This is part of an international political effort to displace Palestinians to allow for the expansion of settlements. In a recent opt, Rabbi Ashman stressed that grassroots efforts are a key element in the struggle to make the human face of the Palestinians visible. They, these were, this is where average citizens come in. The greatest great interest shown by the U.S. and other governments as a direct result of constituents pressing their representatives to express concern on their behalf. This is our best hope to maintain U.S. engagement in keeping Palestinian villages standing. Citizens are also working to make these villages visible and give them back their identity. The question of whether or not Democrats will stand up to fight most egregious acts of violence is an open one, but the main point is this. Politicians rarely do anything that might endanger their re-election unless they are pushed by grassroots efforts persistently and phosphorously. What we are talking about in this specific case is the erasure of the people and cult and the culture, all premise on the assertion that they simply do not exist anyway. This is being done to install their in their place illegal settlements and to populate the land as part of the long standing settler co colonial project in a post truth world where facts and reality itself are too often simply the products of the powerful who want to even more of the world under their control. These actions undertaken by the Rebellion Alliance and HACO are a strong example of how people can fight back and resist falsifications and erasure on both maps and in the world itself. And you have to commend them for this because remember, these Palestinian folks are human beings as well they have the right to live like everybody else regardless who rules that nation and that's why i'm real critical about the israeli government not israelis israel as a whole
Cause like it's happened with uh, a lot of folks in the, around the world. They're moving tribes around. Same thing in the happy United States and Canada, also in Mexico with the Aztecs, the Native the Native the Indian people. Hopefully, I pronounced it correctly. This has to stop. And folks, we gotta let them know they have the right to exist like everybody else. None of these deniers, anything like that. So I recommend everyone out there, doesn't matter where you're at, to let them know, put the put this. Let them know these villages do, do 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 exist, and they have the right to live like everybody else, regardless. As long as they don't bother anybody or violate anyone else's space. All right, next one here. We have off the grid news, and um, and it happened actually. Yeah, off the grid news. It says here, atheist group demands town remove. Nativity, but the town refuses. It's here to stay. This is reported in Berlin, New Mexico. Following years of surrendering of left-leaning organizations to men that they take down religious them Christmas decorations, a number of towns across America are fighting back or simply ignoring the request. Berlin, New Mexico is one such community. In 2015, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, FFRF, has sent a letter to city officials warning that year in nativity located in city park alleged violation violate the U.S. Constitution. The atheist and Gnostic organization wanted the nativity moved to private property, but a year later it remains where it has always been. Berlin is Spanish for Bethlehem, the city where Jesus was born. Our town was named Berlin for a reason, because our founders wanted it to be named after Bethlehem. And of course, what happened in Bethlehem was the birth of Christ, which is something we've expressed since our founding. Berlin Mayor Hera Cordova told KOAT last year, where does it stop? If we don't stand up for negativity scene in Heart of Berlin, next they'll be asking us to change our name. Interview this month by Associate Press Cordova gave an update on negativity is here to stay. Cordova's attitude is similar to that of city officials elsewhere. In Franklin, PA, the city council voted earlier this month to keep a negativity on public property despite a threat of FFRF to help guard against lawsuits. The council decided to add some secular symbols near the negativity. Publicly sponsored nativity scenes on the public property are constitutional, especially when the display includes other secular symbols of the holiday, said Matt Staver, founder of the legal organization Liberty Council, which has offered to provide free assistance to the city if it's sued. We stand by the city and will offer legal counsel to any city facing threats from the RR, FFRF or other individuals. Staver told AP he is you see more municipalities digging in after learning about their rights. FFRF co-president Annie Laurie Gaylor says she didn't, she doesn't think religion or irreligion should be on public property, but some communities are still are surrendering. Gig Harbor, Washington received a letter from FFRF, chose not to allow a local resident put a negativity on private property, and has done it in the past year. That resident, John Scansky told News Tribune he was disappointed. Putting an activity in a public park is a healthy thing, Kenny says. It's a great thing to do. It's all part of Christmas, what Christmas is. This is the message we want out there. Do you believe nativity should be allowed on public property? Share your thoughts in the section below. You know what? I look at it this way. They're stories. No matter what your belief system is, leave them alone. I'm, I got a question for these people from the FFRF. Do you live in Berlin, New Mexico? Okay, then you may have at least have a voice, not some outsiders. I'm sick of these outsiders trying to tell other people what to do. Pathetic. I support religious freedom. I support the separation of church and state. Big difference, because we the state government should should not be followed by a religion. All right, these are like attractions and so forth. You know what? It doesn't bother me one bit. If someone doesn't want to put a bath may on public property, so be it. I don't care. It doesn't offend me. You know, what's going to be next, right? So it's called a domino effect. They don't want, they want, what they're trying to do is push out individual thoughts, thought processes. They'd be very sincere. doesn't matter what your creed is. I remember the time when um, the, 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 the uh, Christ, under, Christ underwater, 
the big nine, like big nine foot statue in the war of the keys. And some of the people got offended. That offends me. I just gave him the middle finger on TV. I wish I'd been there in front of him. Give him a penile microphone too while I'm at it. Then you know what? <laughs> Fight for what's right to those people. And those these buttheads or anyone else trying to tell outside going to tell you what to do in your town. Give them the boot up the rear end. Symbolically speaking, okay? All right. Next one here. Came from 10th Amendment and uh, this one's entitled Missouri Bill Would Legalize Medical Marijuana Foundation to Nullify Federal Prohibition. It came out today, by the way. And who wrote this? Hold on here. Ah, I don't really know, but it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, Shane Trejo. And it says here two bills pre filed in the Missouri Senate in 2017 session would legalize medical marijuana in the state. If signed into law, the legislation would take another step toward nullifying the unconstitutional federal provision. Prohibition on cannabis in practice and effect. Senator Jason Holzman, Democrat from Kansas City, pre filed Senate Bill 56, and Senate Senator Rob Schaff, Republican from St. Joseph, pre filed Senate Bill 153. Each bill would progumate rules and regulations to set up a functioning medical marijuana program in the Show Me State. SB 153 is a duplicate of medical marijuana legislation that failed during the 2016 legislation. This bill will give access to medical marijuana patients suffering from the following qualification conditions. A. Cancer, glaucoma, positive status for human immunodeficiency virus or acquired immune deficiency syndrome, hepatitis C, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, rheumatoid, arthritis, fibromyalgia, Several severe migraines, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, damage to the nervous tissue to, of the spinal cord with objective neurological indication of intractable, intractable, <laughs> intracta, intractable spastic, spasticity, epilepsy, inflammatory bowel disease, neurofasces, Huntington's disease, or B any of the following conditions that is clinically associated with or a complication of a condition under the subdivision or its treatment, cavexia or wasting syndrome, severe or chronic pain, severe nausea, seizures, or severe persistent muscle spasms. And the uh, text of SB 56 is not yet available to the public, but the language is accepted to create specific rules and regulations that sanction the licensing and taxation of medical marijuana in the state. This bill summary provided by the state of Missouri claims SB 56 will pertain to licensing businesses and facilities and certifying parent patients and allowing the department to charge fees, limit the number of licenses issued and the quantities of marijuana that may be possessed. Nothing new there, but it's good. Despite the federal provision of marijuana, measures such as SB 56 and SB 153 remain perfectly constitutional and the feds can do little if anything to stop them in practice effect of federal prohibition if SB 56 and SB 133 are signed into law it would partially remove one layer of law prohibiting possession and use of marijuana in Missouri but federal pro prohibition would remain in place don't worry we still got jury nullification remember that of course the federal government lacks any constitutional authority to ban or regulate marijuana within the borders of a state despite the opinion of the politically connected lawyers on the Supreme Court if you doubt this, ask yourself why it took a constitutional amendment to institute federal alcohol prohibition. While these Missouri bills would not alter federal law, they would take a step toward nullifying, in effect, the federal ban. If we have statistics show that law enforcement makes approximately 9 out of 100 marijuana arrests under state, not federal law. By easing the state laws, the Missouri legislative legislator would remove some of the basis of the 90, for 99% of marijuana arrests. Furthermore, figures indicate it would be it would take 40% of the DEA's yearly budget just to investigate an all raids of the dispensaries in Los Angeles, a single city in a single state. That doesn't include the cost of prosecution. The lesson: the, lack, the feds lack the resources to enforce marijuana prohibition without a state assistance. Growing movement. Missouri could join a growing number that are simply ignoring federal prohibition and nullifying it into practice. 
Colorado, Washington State, Oregon, Alaska have already legalized recreational cannabis, with California, Nevada, Maine, and Massachusetts set to join them after ballot initiatives in favor for of legalization were passed in their states early this month, with more than two dozen states allowing cannabis for medical use as well. The feds find themselves in a position where they simply can't enforce prohibition anymore. The lesson is here pretty straightforward. When enough people say no to the federal government and enough states pass laws backing those people up, there is not much the feds can do to shove their so-called laws, regulations, or mandates down our throats. The 10th Amendment Center founder and executive director Michael Bolton said, Bolden said, Next up, Senate Bill 56 and Senate Bill 153 must officially must be officially introduced next year before they can receive commitment assignments. The bill needs to be approved by the respective committees before they can proceed to the full Senate for consideration. Well, everyone has shown me state need to take the initiative on making that happen. And I love it because there's no victim, no crime, and natural law does prevail in the show me state, which is called Missouri. So folks out there, let the people in Jefferson City know who's the boss is you, the people of Missouri. No one else, not even Donald Trump. And I say that out of respect. Make it happen. I will, And we will give you the thumbs up for sure. And that's what's great about the 10th Amendment because things are happening. Everyone's wigging out, still wigging out about the president. But you know what? He needs us more. We need him. Plain and simple. All right. This one here, if I'm correct, let me just check this out. Yeah, it's a little speech here, a little commentary. It's written by David Gornoski, and, and of course, Lou Rockwell put this out here. The burn, burning the government flag. As it reads here, now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why you have forsaken me? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yelled up his spirit. And behold, the vile temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. Tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. That's the gospel of Matthew 27. That's from the New American Bible, Standard Bible. Well, Jesus is being crucified, surrounded by jury mob squeeze of any ounce of human empathy by power of the collectivist think. The snowballing effect of, of persecution has caused even his followers to flee in fear and silence as he suffered. Jesus quote a lyric from a famous psalm lyric. What would be equivalent today of quoting a Leonard Cohen lyric, hallelujah, hallelujah, as you haters laughingly torture you to death. Mussolini experienced this. So did Gaddafi. As scapegoats, they were innocent of the society's total sin complex, but guilty of particular grave evils, still unserving of such leering violence. But why would we care? We don't see any of it. We've got 401ks to manage, piano classes after school, resumes to build, bathroom politics to fight over, and kale pre-made salad pick packs to buy. Who cares? So, in other words, too many distractions, right? What was also different about Jesus from all other scapegoat kings, ancient and modern, that he forgave his torturers during the act. He knew that they had the words of Caiaphas, the high priest coursing through their veins. It's better that one man die than the whole nation perish. Just who did this different one think he was claiming to be son of man? He made people look bad and might get everyone killed by the Romans. So to stave off their imagined chaos, they made him take one for the team. And they enjoyed it. Just like we enjoy sticking it to the 1%, the drug user, the ugly-looking driver with a suspended license on trial, or any other 
victims that run afoul of laws. We hope for that use physical violence, financial confiscation, or imprisonment for nonviolent behaviors. After Jesus died, the veil of the temple is torn. The temple was the center of his cultural worlds. It was everything behind the veil. The high priest performed blood sacrifice on animals for the atonement of the people's collective sins. It was sacred. Yes, you have a couple of dogs in here, a few dogs. I got mine. There's a couple of dogs across from the from the shop, the cafe. So Jake's like looking there. It's like, who? Look at look, who, who are these guys. That's ah, so okay. You did not question or touch that. Now the veil, veil has is ripped and half to reveal an empty room. No one is home. Suddenly, people across the city report encounters with saints raised from the tombs. What's going on here? Consider a flashback in the life of Jesus. Woe to you, Lord, as well, for you weigh men down with burden to bear, hard to bear, while yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you built the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers because it was they who killed them and built and you built their tombs. For this the reason, but also the wisdom of God said, I will send them to the prophets and apostles. And some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute. So that blood of all prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I will tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge you yourselves did not enter, and you hindered of those who are entering. That's in the Gospel of Luke 11. Interesting. Lawyers, I think it's fine. I'm not trying to preach the choir here. It's just what he wrote, so bear with me, okay? Lawyers, the ones who interpreted and codified the law of Jesus' nation, were in fact accomplices in murder. Murder against prophets, saints who exposed the folly of the logic work of sacrificial murder and domination as unity. They, they key to the knowledge they try to hide from people was that God loves us and does not require a blood sacrifice to do so. We did. We, in our attempts at preserving the unity in our communities, would place our collective sins onto backs of a misfit, preferably a smelly he goat, but more often than admit it, a human and cast them out or kill them. It creates the same relief we feel today when we watch the bad guy get destroyed in the Hollywood drama or watch a police with lights behind us turn and rush past us tactically acknowledging our membership and seeing nothing to see here good citizen try Q President elect Donald Trump nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag if they do there must be consequences perhaps the loss of citizenship or year in jail his vanquished foe in voting right of passage on November 8th would be scapegoat Queen Hillary Clinton had tried to enact such a law in 2005 which called for a $100,000 fine or one year in jail for anyone who burned a flag in protest, which you can look it up yourselves, my friends. It is a fact. Our nation in the year 2016 AD cast 128 million votes of hires for two individuals who agreed that human beings should be cast into cages or robbed for burning a symbolic flag. Cages were were there weak, weakenly, wistingly, no violence and rapes are possible for burning fabric. And you think we've reached some secular post-religion enlightened state? What happens when someone burns a flag? Once symbolic fabric is burnt, there is nothing left but ashes on an empty space. And no one is home. When the veil was torn at Jesus' death, the narrative reveals no one is home. In the place where blood sacrifice was burnt and demanded our social demand social order and unity, as the morning drive host echoed Trump's stance, the flag is one symbol that we have that unite us all. Where it's burnt and collective coffin concealed is to expose molestation in the minds of those who have faith in the state. This creates severe cognitive dissonance. 
and those who rest their faith in a nation state to provide them unity with their neighbor. Unite us as one body, one body united by voracious sacrifice of all thousands of soldiers, live bodies torn asunder under that flag. The, the, those young boys used to play in the yard with their papas and moms. They used to look into the eyes of their grandmother, searching for the wisdom of the universe in their glimmer. They used to feel the warmth of their mother's embrace after a dark night under of thunderstorms. They used to hold their sister's hands as they crossed the road, protecting them from hulking cars or beasts of burden flying past just feet away. Now these bodies lay in the rest like seeds, seeds plants planted in the ground after their fruit was consumed for the life of a body. Deep in the sea of soldiers, coffins draped in the same flag, their bodies were offered up for the preservation of our nation's body. Their courage in the face of danger and a noble belief that they must give their life for the preservation of our collective body is a tangled mess of both CFS and Jesus' logic. Jesus says, God desires mercy, not sacrifice, but conceded his, in his actions that sacrifice will happen because humans demand that someone put skin in the game to keep peace. To Jesus, let it never be your neighbor's life for your own gain and peace of mind. A sacrifice must take place to keep the peace. Let it be your own life before consuming the life of another. Yet our national body, like all others, demand that blood sacrifice in times of stress. It demands it in vain. Virtually all wars waged by nations were wars of unnecessary intervention bred by past unnecessary interventions. Yet the nation found it a, a sacred, untouchable calling of the blood sacrifice of its youngest, most virile members in order to feel as one indivisible. Jesus' death tore the veil. Today, flag burners enact a violent perversion of this act by burning the veil over the collective tomb that our pagan dreaming out, dreaming but awakening nation has used to preserve its unity and sense of self. By burning the coffin's veil, they are not using Jesus' humble self-sacrifice to expose the folly of sacrifice of another. Rather, they're burning an effigy. The collective coffin veil is symbolic act violently resisting the power of the nation. But Jesus said not to resist evil with violence. Even the way we symbolically perform protests against our state cult, we must perform nonviolent symbolism, non-aggressive resentful acts like burning effigies. At the time, those most angered by flag burning would do well to consider that Jesus had torn the veil of humanity's old broken sacrificial system. The line, the line between the sacred and profane built on the blood of others is over. So some just refuse to get the memo and want to cling to the old sacrificial way of doing things, but it's simply incompatible with imitating Jesus. We don't get to sacrifice other people, ours, our neighbors, or our faceless foreign boogeyman, ch boogeyman's children for our sense of security and peace. We don't we do not get to turn our face and wash our hands of the violence we commit when we press a button in a hidden voting booth and a perpetuation of laws that use deadly force against misfits for nonviolent acts, whether it's economic greed or personal vice. Adults, aka people who want to imitate Jesus, doesn't don't hit people to get their way. And they certainly don't put people in animal cages rife with PTSD and assault. They themselves were not want to be forced into nonviolent vices due unto others. Don't burn a flag. It perpetuates and mirrors the violent-based logic that gives it such magnetic power over the minds of millions. Don't put people into cages that burn flags. Don't worship or scapegoat flags and the sacred power system that use them. They're dying. The cross pierces the veil. And as such, our human sacrifices are being raised in our nation's heart. The visitation of our conscience reveals that need, the need for no more bloodshed, for reconciliation between neighbors. It's finished. The veil is torn. Interesting little uh, commentary.
You got to look at everything across the board. That's how I see it. It doesn't matter if you support flag burning or not. It's considered freedom of speech. And what really gets me, these politicians, like even Hillary Clinton and now Donald Trump, okay, talk about, about we should arrest people for flag burning. Can you, Hillary, especially Hillary Clinton, can you explain to me, Hillary, how you symbolically burn the flag for being an anti-freedom demonod, hate our Bill of Rights culture? And Donald Trump, I'll give you that same question as well. I could, I could be very fair. Intimate domain, taking people's properties. So, um, something to really look at. Even some of the rhetoric, too, about law enforcement, pro, being more a law enforcement candidate. That's the question you have to really ask them. Then you know me, I'm not being biased, okay? I'm just saying across the board, regardless if you support these individuals or not. But something you have to contemplate. And that's what Mr. David Gronowski is doing. And that is really it. I'd like to thank everyone for listening to the show. Thank you, my friends, once again. Plus, feel free to download and share throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or you want to send me something that's interesting, I should check out. Whatever you do, please address your correspondences with the quorum. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Spreaker, iHeartRadio. Tumblr, YouTube, Freedoms Network, or Scene.Life. In addition, you can email me at LokiLuck3, or just look, look the number three all together at gmail.com. Well, I am going to do a song today, and it's by uh, some, a band, a local band. I came out a couple years, and they recently did the DRI show, uh, I would say uh, almost close to two weeks ago. It's called Armageddon Man. And uh, they're very, like, hardcore punk influence. And they got a, a video, a song called Fist City USA. And uh, check them out. And go to go to Tim Moffitt's link. It's, like, it's on there and uh, on a YouTube YouTube page and get all the information you want about the band. They're entertaining. Uh, Tim likes to run around and should have run around to the crowd. Just should have people singing and all that, which is very cool. Uh, please um, give them a shot. Check it out. Buy their stuff. You won't be disappointed, okay? All right, my friends, once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love, and may your guardian spirits be with you.